All right, it is 12 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome very, everyone to Medical Grand Rounds uh, here at the University of Colorado. We really are very pleased. It's early in the season, so I'll say it a few more times, to be in person again this year here in the Caribbean Conference Room. And so we're encouraging everyone, please come in person. We will continue to offer the Zoom link probably now and for all of time, uh, but it really is more fun to get together uh, and to see each other cross discipline at least once a week. And we do have a special grand rounds today. And so I know that there are a lot of people joining uh, who are from outside the Department of Medicine. And so thank you and welcome to those people as well. As a little bit of a teaser for folks, upcoming talks, uh, we actually have our next two talks are coming from outside the Department of Medicine in an effort to sort of expand what we do and how we think here in uh, internal medicine. On August 23rd, Dr. Donald Neese, uh, who is a practitioner, a professor in family medicine, will be speaking about community engagement and health equity. And then on August 30th, we're gonna have Dr. Catherine Dickinson, who's coming from the School of Public Health, to talk about environmental pollution, environmental justice, and its impact on public health. Both of those should be really profound and interesting talks. As a reminder, you can scan the QR code. All of our talks are open for uh, CME and MOC credit this year. Questions will come primarily from the live audience. Thank you for being here today in person. But our chiefs, thank you, will be watching the Zoom Q&A. And so if you're re watching remotely and have a question for our speakers, feel free to use the Q&A function. Uh, and now I really am very pleased to welcome today's two speakers. I will do a little shorter introduction than usual since it's a, a shared talk and we have a lot to get through. Uh, but we have two international experts on pain, on opiate use and misuse, and also on alternative strategies to combat acute and chronic pain, Dr. Su Susan Calcaterra and Joe Frank. Uh, Dr. Calcaterra is an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Hospital Medicine and the Division of General Internal Medicine. She's the director of the Addiction Medicine Consultation Service, and I'll say director and founder, um, and the associate program director for the Addiction Medicine Fellowship uh, here at the School of Medicine. Dr. Frank is an associate professor in the Div Division of General Internal Medicine, also here at the University of Colorado. And he's also graduate faculty in the University of Colorado Denver uh, Graduate School of Epidemiology. He serves on the Chronic Pain Committee for the VA of Eastern Colorado Health System. He's also a guideline panel member for the updated Canadian guidelines for opiates uh, and chronic non-cancer pain, non pain management. Uh, I will not go deep into their bios because uh, I do want to leave time for them to give their talk today. Suffice to say, they are truly national and international experts in the use of opiates, in the management of pain, both opiate and non-opiate strategies. Um, and the reason I want to sort of skip through the bio a little bit today is I want to welcome this as a special talk. So I know folks are probably familiar with, if you're not, you will be soon, the idea that to reapply for your DEA license, unless you're five years out of training, you need eight hours of training in the use and management of chronic pain and the use of opiates. And so we're really happy as a campus to offer this as one of those eight hours of training. One, to bring awareness to our campus so that people can stay up to date on their licensure. Two, because this is an incredibly important topic and arguably one of the uh, greatest global health crises we're facing today in our country. Um, and we also wanted as Department of Medicine to help out our other departments in meeting this goal, uh, something that some of those other departments may think about less frequently than they do, we do here in internal medicine. And so I'll go ahead and I'll welcome Dr. Joe Frank and Dr. Susan Calcaterra. Thank you very much for being here today. All right. Uh, thanks, Dr. Connors, for that introduction and this opportunity. Um, we're going to be presenting updates in opioid use disorder policy, diagnosis, and treatment. And that brings us to our three learning objectives. Again, we're gonna focus on recent updates um, in opioid policy, especially focusing on implications for clinicians. Two, recognize criteria and challenges in the diagnosis of opioid use disorder. And three, when I'll turn it over to, to Dr. Calcaterra, understand evidence-based medication treatment for opioid use disorder. So to our first objective, we'll, we'll start with a case. This is our 38 year old patient with chronic back pain who presents for routine follow-up. Um, among things we're gonna cover in this visit is to review and refill oxycodone, 10 milligrams, three times a day prescribed for back pain. Your patient describes limited functional benefit with oxycodone and reports worsening pain severity over the past six months. This patient has requested early medication refill on three occasions in the past six months, has completed urine drug testing with expected results uh, no unexpected findings three months ago. We're going to revisit this case a few more times as we go. Before we do, we're going to dive into our first objective and, and really have um, the, the shortest policy overview over the past century to get to what's relevant here in the last few weeks. Uh, but just to set the stage, going back more than 100 years, I think it's uh, sort of helpful to remember where we started with diacetylmorphine, also called heroin trademarked 
more than 100 years ago, supported by the American Medical Association in the early 1900s. We learn things and make changes over time. One of those changes more than 100 years ago was the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act. The reason that's important, we'll get to in a moment, is it really has set the stage for a lot of the policy that can be confusing, uh, but that we're very much living with now. 1914, global pandemic that uh, some of us may remember in 1918, but over those years in 1920, this was sort of litigated in the courts, going to the Supreme Court with this decision that with this tax act, there was licensing, supervision of prescribing of medications like heroin and cocaine, and a decision in 1920 that these medications could not be prescribed for, quote, maintenance. So if a patient came to their physician at that time, prescribing heroin to treat opioid use disorder was deemed illegal. From 1920, I'm going to take us to this timeline. Fast forward, jump over 50 years, which I'm, is a, a big jump, but to 1970 all the way to the Controlled Substances Act, which we're still living with today, and we'll talk more in just a moment. But this is, again, more than 50 years ago, legislation to regulate the manufacture and distribution of illicit substances, created the scheduling system that we're still working with today, Schedule 1, 2, 3. We'll talk more about that. 1973, the DA was formed. Prior to that, this feels like a bit of a historical curiosity, had been called the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, turns into the DEA. And in 1974, the Narcotic Addict Treatment Act, we'll talk a little bit about stigmatizing language later. Uh, we're not going to hear a name like that today, but amended this to create opioid treatment programs that still exist today. In these treatment programs, there was registration and documentation requirements to prescribe medications like methadone to treat opioid use disorder. Fast forward a couple of decades to 2000, the Drug Addiction Treatment Act. Uh, DATA is the acronym. This was the act that created this infrastructure for clinicians to prescribe medications like buprenorphine. We're going to talk a lot about buprenorphine for opioid use disorder and created a system that we call the waiver, the data waiver, or the X waiver back in 2000. Fast forward again, a number of other important laws happening in recent years, the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, which expanded buprenorphine prescribing to nurse practitioners and other clinicians. October 2017, a national public health emergency declared for opioids. And, and, and as Dr. Connor said, this is still active, still ongoing before, during, and, and since the COVID public health declaration. But importantly for today, just last year, December of 2022, buried within the Consolidated Appropriations Act are two key laws that we want to provide an overview here today. The MAT Act removed the buprenorphine waiver. The buprenorphine waiver, also called the X waiver, is gone, no longer exists, as well as patient limits to the number of patients who could be treated with buprenorphine. The unfortunately and very similarly named MATE Act, the MATE Act, is now in force. And that's why we want to present this content today, because it creates a new and distinct eight-hour training requirement for all DEA-registered clinicians. Um, Snapshot of what this looks like when it gets put into a bill is that it, it really takes some digging to figure out what these bills were. They were buried within this big bill. You see lots of other things happening. You see Ukraine assistance, uh, presidential transition improvement, timely issue in last year, no TikTok on government devices, maybe less timely, way, way down at the bottom, buried within this section, Division FF. It takes a lot of digging to find these two laws that are now in force. I'm going to talk first about the MAT Act, the Mainstreaming Addiction Treatment Act, went into effect immediately when this bill became law in December, removed the waiver requirement by amending the Controlled Substances Act. So we'll talk about scheduling, but made it uh, legal to prescribe Schedule Three medications like buprenorphine for opioid use disorder, like any other Schedule Three medications such as codeine and removed patient limits. It used to be that it would start at 30 and it could increase, but there was a limit on the number of patients any individual clinician could treat. The MATE Act, the Medication Access and Training Expansion Act, is really the one that's important for clinicians who have a DEA registration or renewal coming up at any point in the future. It requires prescribers to complete eight hours of training upon renewing or receiving their license. Went into effect just a few weeks ago in late June. So for those who have caught this window and registered since then, you've seen some of this. For those who have not, this will be awaiting you when you next go to the DEA website to renew your registration. Importantly, training can be cumulative, one hour at a time. I think it's worth in interpreting this as, you know, 30 minutes at a time, but adding up to eight hours across multiple sessions and formats, including 
any training done in the past. So some flexibility for people who have already taken these trainings. Where the rubber meets the road with this is that practitioners are required to self-attest one time when they next renew or register. And I'm gonna say a little bit more about this because really the question is for the audience, when you next renew, have you satisfied the requirement? Is there anything else that you would need to do? Easiest to know if you're board certified in addiction medicine or addiction psychiatry, you check the box, you move on, nothing further to do other than keep practicing, taking care of patients. Number two, if you graduated, the quote, in good standing from medical, dental, or several other types of uh, training in the five years prior to when you're registering or renewing. So that's catching sort of earlier career clinicians who have participated in training. Um, importantly, that can involve residency. So content that was delivered during residency as well can add up to those eight hours. And then for everybody else who doesn't meet one or two, it's eight hours anywhere in your training. This could be um, coming in several different places and I'll provide just a few examples. Um, what kind of training is included? Small text on the right to say that this has really been written to be very broad. Substance use disorders, including screening, diagnosis, treatment. That's where we're gonna focus for the rest of the hour to make this count for an hour. We're also gonna talk about effective treatment planning, patient-centered decision-making, then down at the bottom, pain management. So lots of content that can count toward these eight hours. It is written into the law that it needs to come from this long list of accrediting agencies. Department of Medicine Grand Rounds here is included in that. So rest assured that any content that you've participated in here in Grand Rounds counts towards this requirement. And in the end, this is a screenshot that some have may already seen, but when you're registering, you'll see something that looks like this and have an opportunity to click or potentially not click this button on the bottom left. Now, as we wrap up today's presentation, we're gonna describe some resources with the MATE Act. There've really been a lot of online resources that are available. So for those looking for trainings, we're gonna give some examples, but to say that there's a lot out there if you feel like you're somewhere below that eight hours and need to add to that training. Happy to answer more questions about this today um, as we wrap up. But with that rapid overview of the MATE Act and what it means for registering or renewing a DA license, we're gonna dive right in and get into objective number two. So to set the stage a little bit, we started with the past century and to think a little bit more recently in recent years, why we're changing laws, why we're expanding access to uh, effective evidence-based medications for opioid use disorder. It's just to remind us where we are with what we're very concerned about with opioid use disorder, which is death from overdose. So these are data from the CDC. Uh, the CDC posts these, updates them regularly, updated from last month. On the left, we see January of 2015 moving to the right through January of 2023. The blue line there is a threshold that many caught in the headlines when this past year, deaths by overdose exceeded 100,000 Americans. You can see that that number early in the pandemic blew right through that blue line is closer to 107 or 110,000 in the past year has leveled off. That might be a downturn, uh, but that's still just a staggering number of people dying by overdose um, in our country. We're gonna talk a little bit about treatment considerations depending on the type of opioid use, but what this does is it shows those same numbers, that same timeline left to right, 2015 to present, broken down by type of substance that was involved. At the very top is any opioid. That brown line right below that is fentanyl or you know, fentanyl related products. And so you can see that since going way back here to probably 2016 became the substance that was most commonly involved in overdose continues to rise and drive that number upward. So we're thinking about overdoses nationally. Now this is fentanyl with several other substances also increasing, including psychostimulants. The patient we started with, we were talking about prescribing oxycodone. Down here at the bottom, we see those in recent years leveling off a little bit. That's the green and the blue and the purple are uh, medications like oxycodone, methadone and purple way at the bottom. So this is really a story in my view where we wanna center fentanyl uh, and opioids obtained in our communities. But to get to diagnosis, with that context, I'm going to work through these, uh, this framework on the left and think first about diagnosing opioid use disorder and testing. I'm going to refer to this guide from the VA, which I think does a nice job of, of bundling this together. I practice in a pain management setting at the VA, so this has been a useful tool for me. And when we think about testing, we should really be describing this as history taking, talking with our patients, understanding their lives and their health conditions, on the right here is 
a two question screener. And so I think where to start is to ask. And these are questions such as how many days in the past year have you used drugs or other alcohol? Go from there. And when patients screen positive for substance use in the past year, that's when we as clinicians can be thinking in more detail about a diagnosis of opioid use disorder. For the past 10 years, we've been working with the DSM-5 diagnosis for opioid use disorder. I'm gonna walk us slowly down this table, thinking about 11 criteria, and then summarize a little bit for ways that I don't day-to-day -day, uh, memorize all 11 of these, uh, but to think about how to integrate these into discussions that we're having with patients. And the first is craving. This was new with the DSM-5, didn't exist in the prior version. Uh, Example behaviors, constantly thinking about next use or dose. I find this is a word that people can understand. Everybody has craved something, you know, whether it's substances, alcohol, other substances, chocolate, going for a hike, spending time with family. I find this can be an engaging place to ask people what their experience has been with cravings related to substance use. This second group, using larger amounts, inability to cut down recurrent use when it's physically hazardous. Um, examples on the right are really in the context of prescribed medications, taking a larger dose, requesting early medication refills. That's numbers two through four on this list. Next up, continued use despite problems or other harms. And so physical, psychological problems, social and interpersonal problems. Asking patients to understand what are the consequences of your, of your substance use? What, what effect is this having on your life, on your family, on your work? Moving on down to seven, eight, and nine, uh, seven is spending a great deal of time to obtain, use, or recover, failure to fulfill obligations at home and work, and then activities given up. And then down at the bottom, 10 and 11, withdrawal and tolerance. The two asterisks here are a reminder that we should not be using these, these two criteria to make a diagnosis of opioid use disorder when a patient is taking a medication as prescribed by a clinician in the context of their healthcare. Now that's usually gonna be prescribed medications for chronic pain, but use disorder with other prescribed medications could involve withdrawal intolerance. And if a patient's taking them as prescribed, runs out because the mail got lost and they withdraw, we shouldn't be using that as a criteria. To try and think about ways that I remember these as I'm taking a history, as I'm talking with patients again, I think craving can be a useful, a useful way to probe a person's relationship with the substance. So I, I tend to set that apart. These next three, I tend to think about these as control. Patients can sort of relate to the idea of, have you noticed a change? Have you begun to lose control with, of the way you're relating to or using this substance? And then I like to bundle a number of these down here, five through nine as consequences. What impact is this substance and the person's use having on their life, their family, relationships, work? Um, and again, if I'm remembering these three, pulling up up to date some other reference to really get into the details, then I'm learning something helpful about a patient's uh, relationship with a substance and whether or not an opioid use disorder diagnosis is appropriate. With 11 criteria, the other way to think about this that can help guide treatment decisions as we'll talk about, we think meets two to three of these criteria in the past year. Moderate would be four to five and six or more criteria in the past year we'd identify as severe opioid use disorder. Next up here is time. And I think the important point here is to say that this is not a one-time assessment. This is not a checklist. This is a, when we're doing this well, this is a conversation with patients over time across multiple visits. You don't have to ask these in a yes or no format. Oftentimes they just don't work that way. And we want to use these questions uh, as part of a history, but also other pieces of information to pull together a picture in which we can make an assessment. Do I think the patient in front of me has an opioid use disorder? This can be challenging. And so the objective, we alluded to some of the challenges. And if we want to understand these criteria, we have to acknowledge that there's a lot of uncertainty. I think this uncertainty can come in either of two ways in my experience. And one is we look at a criteria and we hope to answer yes or no, but we often answer maybe. We can't quite tell if one of these criteria is happening for this patient at this time. Maybe they can't even tell us in that visit, or they're not in a place where they trust us enough to disclose it on that day. And so you see these, each of these questions as I'm thinking through it, and I'm getting more and more maybes. Maybe I'm not making a diagnosis on that day. Maybe we're re revisiting it in a next visit. And then a second way I think there can be a lot of uncertainty is when opioid use disorder is being assessed in the context of chronic pain. Um, I might have a concern that it seems like you are 
Number eight, failing to fulfill obligations at home or work. And a patient might say to me, I agree with you. It's because my back hurts. I can't get out of bed in the morning. That's why I'm failing to fulfill these obligations. And so it can be really challenging to differentiate when the answer is yes, why? A diagnosis of opioid use disorder really should follow from opioid use. Next up is timing. I think in the course of this discussion, in the course of a relationship, there are moments where we learn something new, and those are moments to not miss. Uh, listed here is assessing use, using urine drug testing, and we're going to see this come back to our patient in our case, using the prescription drug monitoring program data that are available to us, and providing counseling. What would happen if you or somebody in your household had an overdose? Have you thought about that? Can I talk to you about a medication like naloxone, being prepared for the timing when there's a moment that this really needs to be discussed. Um, number four on this list is trust. These questions and discussion really require rapport and trust with a patient. Starts at the top using inclusive language, helping patients feel like in your practice with your team uh, that they can share with you what's actually going on in their lives. Sometimes this requires motivational interviewing, highlighting that we have effective treatments, um, addressing other problems, and as we're gonna talk about with the treatment section here, respecting patient preference, uh, providing information and having it be a conversation and there's more to come on that. And then finally, if that's a lot to fit in, certainly in a general practice setting or in other clinics where there's other things that need to happen in that visit, it's important to think about this as a team effort. This is the VA's model that we call our stepped care model. Um, so number one here is patients um, you know, managing opioid use disorder once the diagnosis has been made. Step two can be medical management and primary care and pain management settings and mental health. Step three, perhaps most appropriate for more severe opioid use disorder. This is engaging specialty care, thinking about more intensive treatment options, but important to think about making this diagnosis and transitioning onto our discussion of treatment as a multidisciplinary team sport. Uh, this, this can uh, be important to have across time, but also with the support of a team. With that description of diagnosing opioid use disorder, we're gonna transition next to talk about evidence-based treatment. Thank you, Joe. So your patient's in clinic and on follow-up, his or her urine had uh, codeine and six monoacetylmorphine and these are heroin metabolites. You discuss the results with your patient and you diagnose opioid use disorder. Your patient's interested in treatment for opioid use disorder, what would you offer? So just think about these for a minute. We actually need more information be before we can start buprenorphine, methadone, clonidine, diphenhydramine, also known as uh, Benadryl, lopiramide, extended release naltrexone for psychosocial treatment. So there are three FDA approved medications uh, in the United States to treat opioid use disorder, methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. All of these medications have activity at the mu opioid receptor. So in this figure along the X axis, you have opioid dose and along the Y axis, you have opioid effect. The first medication methadone is a full agonist at the mu opioid receptor. So what that means is it binds completely to the opioid receptor and it completely activates the opioid receptor. So increasing doses of methadone leads to increasing analgesia, increasing euphoria, increasing sedation and overdose. Buprenorphine is a partial agonist at the mu opioid receptor. So while it binds to the uh, opioid receptor and it actually has very high affinity, it binds very tightly, it does not fully activate the receptor. And because of this pharmacology, it has something called a ceiling effect. So what we see in practice is that doses above 24 to 32 milligrams a day don't seem to have increasing opioid effect. And this makes it a very safe medication for the treatment of opioid use disorder because when used alone, buprenorphine virtually never causes overdose. And then finally, we have naltrexone. This is a full antagonist at the opioid receptor. So it's a, essentially, it's a long-acting naloxone. If a patient is taking naltrexone and they take an opioid medication, they will have no opioid effect. It also is, uh, does not show up on a urine drug screen because it's not an opioid. So methadone, again, for the treatment of opioid use disorder, it is a full agonist. It's Schedule II under the Controlled Substances Act. 
And it's been around the longest of all of our three medications. It was FDA approved in 1972. We have the most data for methadone for the treatment of opioid use disorder. When we're treating opioid use disorder, it's dispensed in a liquid formulation, and this is to prevent diversion. Methadone's analgesic activity is very similar to, methadone, uh, to morphine or oxycodone. It's about six to eight hours. But when we're using it to treat opioid use disorder, it lasts about 24 to 36 hours to prevent withdrawal and cravings. Just so people know, a typical dose of methadone in a methadone clinic setting ranges from eight to 150 milligrams a day. In the United States, uh, we can only dispense methadone for the treatment of opioid use disorder from an opioid treatment program formerly called a methadone clinic. Um, this is uh, only the United States and uh, it's a result of the historical legislation in our country. Again, when we're dispensing methadone for the treatment of opioid use disorder, it comes in a liquid formulation. The patient goes to the methadone clinic, they drink their methadone dose, and then they have to drink a sip of water. They open their mouth for the methadone nurse and they get to go on their merry way. Methadone has really interesting pharmacology. It has an incredibly long half-life. So we have to be careful about the methadone dose when we're starting. So when a patient receives methadone, they have that peak effect between three to four hours after that dose. But again, the half-life is 24 to 36 hours. So when it's at an adequate dose, they should not have withdrawal symptoms for that period of time. When starting, it takes about three to seven days to reach steady state. And so we do have to be careful when we're starting methadone that the patient um, is not at risk of overdose. Next is buprenorphine. Buprenorphine is that partial agonist. So it binds really tightly to the opioid receptor, but does not fully activate it. This is schedule three in contrast to methadone, which is schedule two under the Controlled Substance Act. It was FDA approved in 2002 for the treatment of opioid use disorder. It has very high affinity and slow dissociation from that receptor. So it also hangs on to that receptor for a while compared to other opioids. Because of that ceiling effect, it has a very low risk of respiratory depression, and a usual dose for people with opioid use disorder for buprenorphine ranges from 16 to 32 milligrams a day. And just to give you some context, um, one milligram of, of buprenorphine is approximately equivalent to 40 morphine milligram equivalents. And a 24 milligram daily dose is approximately 960 MMEs. When we're treating opioid use disorder, buprenorphine comes in a di couple different formulations. So the buprenorphine um, naloxone product called Suboxone comes in a film and a tablet. Both of these products must be dissolved underneath the tongue. If they're swallowed, they're inactive. The naloxone is also inactive. If it's dissolved under the tongue, it remains inert. And the reason for the naloxone in the Suboxone product is to prevent um, injection. Uh, there's also extended release uh, buprenorphine. Sublocate is the most commonly, uh, commonly used drug um, for, for uh, long extended release buprenorphine. Um, and it lasts 30 days. And then Berxati was just FDA approved maybe a month or so ago for the treatment of opioid use disorder. It comes in a week dose and a 30 day dose. It's important to mention that buprenorphine um, is also FDA approved for pain. It comes in different formulations. There's a Butrans patch. Um, and the important thing to note when we're talking about buprenorphine for pain, it's dosed in micrograms. When we're talking about buprenorphine for opioid use disorder treatment, it's dosed in milligrams. So the two formulations for pain is the Butrans patch placed every uh, seven days for pain management and the buckle formulation called Belbuca. Um, this is placed on the inside of the cheek and it's dosed either Q-Day or, or BID. And again, notice the microgram dosing. There's also an intravenous version of buprenorphine um, used for acute pain. And then lastly, extended release intramuscular naltrexone. This is a full antagonist at that opioid receptor. It's not scheduled because it's not an opioid. It was FDA approved in 2006. And it's really important to note that a patient has to remain opioid free for about seven days before starting this medication. If you start it too soon, you're gonna precipitate opioid withdrawal and the patient is gonna feel really terrible. Um, the intramuscular injection lasts about 30 days, and it's important to tell your patient that after that 30 days is over, if they're, if they're going to return to opioid use, they're at a very high risk of overdose death. That's because for that last 30 days, if they've used any opioids, their opioid receptors have not seen it, and so they are no longer tolerant to opioids. 
And then oral naltrexone is a medicine we use um, as well to treat alcohol use disorder. Um, it has been shown to be non-inferior to placebo for the treatment of opioid use disorder. And that's mainly because people tend to be non-compliant. Vivitrol is extended release naltrexone. This is what it looks like. Um, and it's, uh, it's a, uh, available in many outpatient settings. It's also available in our hospital um, for the treatment of alcohol use disorder for which it's also FDA approved, but can be used for opioid use disorder as well. So what are the data for these medications? So we know that when taken regularly and compared to no medications, methadone is associated with a 60% mortality reduction and buprenorphine is associated with a 40% mortality reduction. And these results have been replicated in many, many studies and in many, many populations and many, many practice settings. They're highly effective medications. Extended release naltrexone has been shown to have similar treatment retention at six months compared to buprenorphine, but it has not been shown to be associated with a reduction in overdose deaths or opioid related acute care utilization at three or 12 months. So its use for the treatment of opioid use disorder is a little bit less solid um, and when to use it is really a decision between the patient and the clinician. In the absence of methadone or buprenorphine, detoxification, so the use of clonidine, loperamide, et cetera, um, really has zero mortality benefit. Um, you're not doing your patient any favor by detoxing them. And then behavioral treatment, so we're talking about psychosocial treatment, um, we're talking about inpatient, outpatient treatment. In the absence of the use of buprenorphine or methadone, um, has not been shown to be associated with a reduction in overdose death or op opioid-related acute care utilization. And then as Joe alluded to, patients and clinicians really need to make the decision about what medication they use together. So when I'm meeting a patient for the first time and they've, I've made a diagnosis of opioid use disorder, I typically will just ask them, have you received treatment before or have you used buprenorphine before? What worked about it or what didn't work about it? If they've never tried any medicines for opioid use disorder, I'll talk to them and I'll say, hey, listen, we live in a place where there are no opioid treatment programs. So methadone probably isn't the right medicine for you because you have to go to the clinic six days a week to pick up your methadone dose. In those scenarios, buprenorphine might be the better, better medication. They can get a prescription and up to a 30 day supply. So it's really important to talk to your patient about the pros and cons of each treatment. And then they need to decide what medicine they want because the medicines only work if they're gonna take them. So you've decided your patient meets criteria for opioid use disorder and they're interested in treatment. So what would you offer? So probably buprenorphine. Methadone, unless you work in an OTP, you cannot prescribe methadone in the outpatient setting. Clonidine, diphenhydramine, and loperamide have no mortality benefit. Extended release naltrexone, it's a little tricky. We know that it doesn't necessarily have mortality benefit, but there are select cases when patients may prefer extended release naltrexone. In my clinical experience, one case was a, a surgeon that was in recovery and was afraid they could relapse um, and they were concerned about what might show on their urine drug screen. So they elected to use extended release naltrexone. And then psychosocial treatment in the absence of methadone or buprenorphine has, has no mortality benefit, but I recommend psychosocial treatment if the patient's also using buprenorphine or methadone. A few words on disparity in opioid use disorder treatment. So there are racial and ethnic disparities. Black Americans are 80% less likely to receive buprenorphine versus white Americans. There are geographic disparities. So people that live in rural areas commonly have very long drive times to get to a methadone clinic in their community. Um, we also see in rural areas that there's decreased access to buprenorphine prescribers. I will say one, one nice um, thing that came from the COVID pandemic was the use of telehealth to prescribe buprenorphine. And so this gap has been narrowed slightly. And then insurance status. So in, the, in Colorado, there are residential treatment programs for um, addiction that do accept Medicaid, but we've seen that those programs have really long wait times. And in the epic, uh, epidemic of fentanyl, we just don't have a lot of time to wait. People are dying quickly. So that is a barrier for some patients. So your patient says that they've never engaged in treatment for opioid use disorder before. And you, go, you review these treatment options and with shared decision-making, you decide that buprenorphine is a good option. And so you consider starting buprenorphine using a traditional buprenorphine initiation approach. So what is that? 
So buprenorphine initiation is 99.9% .9 done at home. You, you'll hand out your patient an instructional guide, and I'm going to show you a resource on the guide I like to use and where to find it. A traditional buprenorphine initiation requires complete opioid sensation. It requires that the patient experiences mild to moderate opioid withdrawal symptoms before they start buprenorphine. And those opioid withdrawal symptoms guide the timing of the buprenorphine start. It's really important to talk to your patient that if they start buprenorphine too soon, they can precipitate opioid withdrawal. So common opioid withdrawal symptoms that can guide buprenorphine starts includes experiencing nausea, having vomiting or diarrhea, feeling very anxious, like they're crawling out of their skin or very irritable, insomnia, hot and cold flushes, perspiration, tearing eyes, yawning, muscle cramps. These are things that you, once you've seen it, you don't forget it. In the hospital setting, we use the clinical opiate withdrawal scale to assess severity of opioid withdrawal. I think of this as being analogous to the CWA or the MIND scale or the SOS scale. Um, and typically for opioid, um, excuse me, typically for initiation of buprenorphine, we tell people we want their score to be between 10 and 12. That usually equates to three objective opioid withdrawal symptoms. So let's talk about precipitated withdrawal. And precipitated withdrawal is a result of this partial agonism that buprenorphine has. So remember, it binds to the opioid receptor, but does not fully activate it to the extent that a full agonist does. But it also is a result of its very high affinity. And so buprenorphine displaces full agonist opioids from the opioid receptor. And so if you start that buprenorphine too soon, a patient will feel a relative increase in their opioid withdrawal symptoms. And they feel really terrible. So it's important to define precipitated opioid withdrawal because there is precipitated opioid withdrawal and then there's undertreated opioid withdrawal. So when I think of precipitated withdrawal, I think of a rapid onset of opioid withdrawal symptoms after that initial buprenorphine dose, typically about 30, 30 minutes after that dose, and a rise in the clinical opioid withdrawal scale by more than five points. So we're talking objective findings. We're talking dilation of the pupils. We're talking goosebumps really severe anxiety, the patient's restless, restless, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Um, and that is precipitated withdrawal. And the reason why it matters to, dis to distinguish between precipitated withdrawal and undertreated opioid withdrawal is because the management's different. So when to consider a traditional buprenorphine initiation, if the patient's never tried buprenorphine, buprenorphine before and they're interested, they're not on methadone for the treatment of opioid use disorder. And this has to do with methadone's very long half-life and it can be challenging for a patient to experience sufficient withdrawal symptoms to start buprenorphine. They're not requiring opioids for acute pain, so they're not post-op. They can tolerate mild to moderate opioid withdrawal symptoms. So here's how you do it. You tell your patient, go home, stop your opioids, stop your fentanyl, stop your heroin, stop, stop the opioids that you're having a problem with. And then just wait, wait for your withdrawal symptoms because they will come. Again, this is a, we usually think of a clinical opiate withdrawal score of greater than 10 to 12. But what this means for a person at home is that they're having three or more objective signs of withdrawal. Once they're having three or more objective signs of withdrawal, I say, take that first dose of buprenorphine. Typically it's about four milligrams. And then wait, wait an hour, wait 45 minutes, wait two hours. If you still feel badly, take that second dose and repeat that over the course of the day until you feel normal. On day one, that dose is typically between 12 to 16 milligrams. And then on day two, they wake up and they take that total daily dose from day one and they wait. They usually will wait six hours or so. If they feel cravings, if they feel kind of achy and not well, then they can take another four milligrams knowing that the final dose for most people with opioid use disorder ranges between 16 to 24 milligrams. There are exceptions and we've seen with lots of fentanyl use people needing 32 milligrams, but the, the typical patient is 16 to 24. I mentioned that you give your patient a take home guide for doing this at home. This is one of my favorites. It comes from Yale. I have the, the link down at the bottom. Um, it's actually the Yale ED buprenorphine start that they give their patients. So in the blue here, it tells you um, the patient how many hours they, they probably need to wait before starting the medicine, buprenorphine. And then it also tells the patient they should feel three or more of these symptoms, these objective symptoms of withdrawal. On day one, they take about four milligrams of bup when they start feeling those symptoms. 
They repeat the process up to about 12 or 16 milligrams on day one and day two, they take whatever dose there was on, on day one that they took and repeat that until they're about 16 to 24 milligrams. Again, this medicine is incredibly safe. Your patient is not gonna overdose on buprenorphine. There are alternative buprenorphine initiation strategies. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it because um, this talk is, is really sort of a brief overview. We use a low dose initiation strategy for people who have um, had experience from precipitated withdrawal with buprenorphine before, and they have a lot of hesitation to retry buprenorphine. If your patient says, I cannot stay off of fentanyl long enough to develop withdrawal symptoms, um, and they're interested in buprenorphine, this is a good approach. It's a really excellent approach if a patient's transitioning from chronic opioid therapy for pain, sort of the patient that Joe described that may meet criteria for opioid use disorder to get them onto buprenorphine. Um, and we use this all of the time in the hospital. If your patient's got acute pain and they're really needing those, those short acting opioids for pain management, we think that they're, they're, those acute opioid um, meds are gonna come off in the next couple of days. Uh, we can do a low dose initiation with buprenorphine. It works very well. It can be done both in the inpatient and the outpatient setting. And I will show you resources at the end where you can find strategies or protocols if you're interested. So how does, uh, how does a low dose buprenorphine initiation work? Well, it has everything to do with that high affinity of buprenorphine to the opioid receptor. So we tell a patient during the co course of the low dose initiation that they're gonna keep their full agonist opioid on board. So if they're using fentanyl at home, they're gonna continue to use fentanyl through this process. If they're in the hospital and they're getting oxycodone and Dilaudid for pain, we continue those medicines during this process. On day one, we just give them a whiff of buprenorphine. We're talking 0.5 milligrams. On day two, we give them 0.5 BID and we slowly increase the dose until they're at, at a therapeutic dose. This process can happen quickly. I've done this in 24 hours and you can do it over seven days. It's really driven by um, how much time you have for your patient if they're in the hospital, discharge planning, or the patient's desire to get to an adequate dose of buprenorphine. The rationale for a low dose buprenorphine initiation, it truly is a patient-centered approach. You do not have to experience any opioid withdrawal to start buprenorphine with the low dose initiation because you're continuing that full agonist that whole time. And so you don't measure a cow score in this process. It allows the patient to continue their full agonist opioids and it reduces and I would say it totally mitigates the risk of precipitated withdrawal when done correctly. So we're gonna continue with our case. Unfortunately, our patient has started using fentanyl. They're hospitalized, you see them in the hospital, they've been diagnosed with endocarditis and they have very painful septic pulmonary emboli. On exam, your patient has tearing eyes, runny nose. They're very agitated and super uncomfortable. And you talk to them and you say, how can I help you? And they say, doc, I do not want buprenorphine. I want methadone. So can we give patients methadone in the hospital? Yes, we can. This may be a surprise to some people. When I was training, we didn't give methadone to anyone, um, but absolutely. So this is the DEA. This is Title 21 Code of Federal Regulations, Title 13.06.07. Um, and it talks about administering or dispensing narcotic drugs when patients are hospitalized for a medical condition, whether it's endocarditis, whether it's um, cellulitis or osteomyelitis, it is okay to use any opioid. You can use oxycodone, you can use morphine, you can use buprenorphine, you can use methadone, any opioid to reduce their opioid withdrawal symptoms. So in hospital methadone, if a patient has opioid use disorder, it is incredibly safe. Remember, I told you that the normal dose of methadone for someone enrolled in an opioid treatment program is 80 to 150. We use low dose methadone in the hospital, and I'll show you how we do that um, to manage opioid withdrawal symptoms. Because methadone is a full agonist at that mu opioid receptor, it does not cause precipitated withdrawal. So we don't use a cow score to start methadone. We just look at the patient and do a physical exam. If they have mild opioid withdrawal symptoms, it's safe to start methadone. And I, I really want to be clear that the use of methadone for opioid withdrawal in the hospital setting is endorsed by the Society of Hospital Medicine and also the Society of Addiction Medicine. So here's how we do it. Um, and this is pretty standard across the country. So you meet your patient and they're uncomfortable. 
I wouldn't sit down and try to get a long history with them. That's not going to help you. And it's not going to help the patient. If they have opioid withdrawal symptoms, it's very safe to start methadone. So I usually will start between 10 to 30 milligrams. If they're using fentanyl, I always start with 30 milligrams. And remember that peak effect is at three to four hours. So I come back in three to four hours. If they still look uncomfortable and they say, I feel terrible, I'm going to give them another 10 of methadone on day one for a max dose of 40 milligrams. Because of that federal law, I just showed you if the patient's still in opioid withdrawal, there's no reason you can't give them short acting opioids to help get them um, feeling more comfortable because the goal is to just keep them in the hospital to receive that medical treatment they need. On day two, I give them the total dose that I gave them on day one of methadone, and I can give them another 10 if they need it. And on day three, I give them whatever that dose was on day two. So in this scenario, 50 milligrams, and then I give them another 10 if they need it. 60 milligrams is a, is a decent dose to keep people in the hospital. Um, the goal is to really just make sure that when you see them, they don't have any objective signs of opioid withdrawal. We use liquid. So at discharge, methadone, remember, cannot be prescribed in the outpatient setting outside of an OTP. So the patient cannot receive a methadone prescription from you at discharge. Um, ensure that that patient is dosed with their methadone on the day of discharge because they're going to need to follow up at that OTP within 24 hours before they start withdrawing. I always refer patients to a local OTP. We have many of them here in the Metro Denver area. Um, you can find them on the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration website here under treatment resources, and then there's OTPs listed by zip code. There are many here in Denver. And always, please, always prescribe naloxone at discharge for overdose. So we talked about resources. Um, the New England Journal of Medicine Pain Management and Opioid um, CME is free. It's 10 hours. The California Bridge is your friend. It has incredible protocols for buprenorphine starts, management of precipitated withdrawal, methadone starts, and low-dose buprenorphine starts. Resources for treatment are available on the SAMHSA website, as well as the Colorado Ladders Program. Copic has a lot of training resources for, for these eight hours that you need. And then the Colorado Consortium here on campus has wonderful CME training modules. And then lastly, if you're like me and you're a podcaster, Curbsider Addiction Medicine podcasts are fantastic. And you can get CME credit for those podcasts if you download it. Um, and that those also meet criteria for the eight hours. So we're happy to take any questions if you have any, and we appreciate your attention. All right, we'll have Dr. Frank go back to the front and we'll start with some questions from our audience. Thank you, this is excellent, really appreciate it. Um, so the New England Journal Pain Management and Opioids, I think a lot of us may have taken that in preparation for our license renewal, our, our MD license renewal. So if we took that in the spring, it sounds like this would also carry forward into DEA. Great to know, thank yep. you. I did like that one, by the way, that's a great oh, resource. Good. And Christine, I'll just add one comment. I think what uh, what's recommended is that for those renewing a DA license that you have documentation, have uh, know when those eight hours were completed. For those who completed training many years ago, I did the buprenorphine waiver training. I think I'm neglected to mention that that counts for the current eight hour training. Um, but it's, I think, good practice to know when you completed it, know how many hours you completed it. It's not going to be required to be submitted. In theory, somebody might come back to a clinician to say, you know, we'd like to see documentation of the, those eight hours. Currently, there's no requirement for that. But probably good practice to know what you completed, when it was, if you're confident you completed those eight hours. Uh, I had two questions. The first was with regards to kind of like the micro inductions for um, buprenorphine. Is there any reason to not use that as like your primary initiation strategy if it is more patient-centered and kind of helps not precipitate withdrawal? Yeah, so I think it, ta it depends on the clinical setting. So in the hospital, if a patient came in with an overdose event um, and their anticipated hospitalization is like 24 hours, I would, and they're already probably experiencing some opioid withdrawal, I would prefer to just do initiation traditionally because I can get them out of the hospital in less than 24 hours. Um, I think, um, you know, in the outpatient setting, it's preferable to 
not recommend they continue fentanyl and get on buprenorphine as fast as possible. I think what anecdotally, what we're seeing is that low dose initiations in the outpatient setting can be very challenging for people that are using a lot of fentanyl. They just cannot stop at that seven days. So I prefer traditional. If I can do it, it's faster. I get a patient on a therapeutic dose of buprenorphine quickly and I'm done. Um, the second one I had was more just kind of Colorado specific. I mean, obviously methadone being a full agonist, um, and the Denver metro area having like a lot of options for um, facilities. Do you feel that in the future there will be any kind of change in like rural areas that allows for prescribers to use methadone as a as an adjuvant therapy? Yeah. So this just actually went before the House of Representatives in Congress, um, and it was so essentially there was a bill put forth by a senator in New Jersey. Um, it was called the Moda Act. And the, the act was, the, the hope was to expand methadone prescribing in the outpatient setting by addiction trained, addiction medicine and addiction psychiatry trained physicians with dispensing of methadone in pharmacies, which is what they do in Canada and England. Um, and it was killed. So that's the dream, maybe, but not next year. <laughs> I also had two questions, if that's okay. The sure. first one is about buprenorphine and dyspnea relief. Does it provide any uh, dyspnea relief? And the second one was about methadone and those doses, how you handle um, EKGs and looking at, um, uh, you know, whether or not we think the um, QT intervals. I, I couldn't hear your first question. Let me answer the second question. And then maybe you can say the first question again. So, yeah. So um, if a patient comes in, to the hospital and in the ER, if you think about what medications are typically given, there are a lot of QT prolonging medications, right? Like so for anti-emetics, those sorts of things. So if a patient comes in and their QTC is 520, if they're already on methadone, um, I usually will wait 24 hours and see if those short acting meds, Zofran have cleared, recheck an EKG. If we've minimized QTC prolonging medications and their QTC is still prolonged, I have a risk benefit conversation with a patient. If someone says to me, I've been on methadone for 20 years and I'm stable and I'm willing to accept this risk, I am not gonna adjust their methadone dose. I do not want them to relapse because the risk of dying from an overdose is much higher than that QTC of 13. If their QTC is 600, then the recommendation is to dose reduce be between 10 and 20%. You wait three days because of the half-life, reassess QTC and go from there. And then I didn't hear the, the first, it was dysthymia, was it? Uh, it was about dyspnea lysis, whether you can use buprenorphine similar to morphine or other opiates for the relief of dyspnea. For their, for their- Shortness of breath. Sorry. I don't know. That's a great question. Do you know? Uh, agree, it's a great, great question. I don't know. I'm not aware of buprenorphine being used specifically for management of dyspnea. I think that what comes to mind for me is if we're managing dyspnea in the context of pain management or opioid use disorder treatment, you know, compared to the alternatives, um, it, it's safer for the reasons that uh, Susan described. So I think would be a, a good option. Um, I just, it, it may provide those benefits, but I'm not aware that it's been looked at individually specifically for you know, replacing other agents for that indication. I had one question, then we'll go online. Can you talk about the use? You mentioned it briefly, the use of buprenorphine for short-term pain management. Um, does it also seem to have a ceiling effect? Like, does it manage pain up to a certain point or is it as or, or a highly effective medication that we could be using more in the inpatient side? Yeah, I don't recommend using it for acute pain. It's a really old medicine, so it's been around. The reason why I mention IV buprenorphine is that many places are using IV buprenorphine to do low dose buprenorphine transitions. So it's really effective. You can transition someone in three days using IV buprenorphine. Um, I would say probably if a patient's had a very painful surgery, just use a full agonist. And I'll just make a plug. It was, the question was not about chronic pain management, but you know, I think um, in addition to this talk, it can be an excellent tool for chronic pain management. I think in a shared decision-making approach, it's important to um, discuss it with patients. This is something that the VA has made a big push on in recent years to make it more available, make sure people are aware of this. I've heard from a number of people in recent years to, you know, have a good experience for pain management in the absence of opioid use disorder, but to say something along the lines of, how have I not heard of this by now? And I think it's often just not something we're thinking of or trained on in term in a chronic pain context, but you asked about acute pain, but in chronic pain, I think important to think about there as well. 
All right, then we have a comment from online and a question. A comment for patients receiving methadone in the hospital, please also send a last dose letter to the OTP and print one out for the patient. If an OTP is unable to confirm the patient's last dose, they'll usually restart at 30 milligrams. And then the question, which is similar, I think, to earlier ones, but have there been any policy attempts to allow methadone to be prescribed in clinics and not only in OTPs? Is that safe? I'm not sure if I added, answered it adequately, but yeah, there are many people, um, there's a free methadone liberation movement, but, um, and there's, there, I think we'll get there, but uh, we're just not there yet. There's too much stigma associated with um, the treatment of opioid use disorder. I will tell you that many OTPs are very carceral. It's not a friendly environment. And so it, we need to do a better job in the United States. Dr. Mowry. Is there any like standard protocol or recommendation for like perisurgical management with um, someone who's on buprenorphine or is it very dramatically by the type of surgery and like what's involved in anesthesia? No, I didn't get into that because it's a little bit outside of the scope, but um, if a patient is maintained stably on buprenorphine and they're coming in, the recommendation by many societies, including anesthesiology societies, pain management societies is to continue buprenorphine during the, the perioperative period. Um, buprenorphine is very similar to methadone in that its analgesic effect is Q six to eight hours. So we recommend dose splitting of buprenorphine. Um, and then you're treating their acute pain using full agonist, typically two to three times higher than the usual dose that you would give for an opioid naive person. Um, the goal is then to sort of work with the patient to get them back on that buprenorphine dose. Um, without any full agonist opioids prior to discharge. This doesn't always happen, but um, please, please do not stop buprenorphine in the perioperative period. If you do, you're basically in creating this very large opioid deficit. We saw how many MMEs of morphine were in, um, morphine equivalents were in buprenorphine. So if you stop buprenorphine in that perioperative period, now you're trying to just get them to not withdraw. And then you're trying to manage pain and the amount of opioids you'd have to give them is a lot. So continue buprenorphine. If the patient's not on any medicines for opioid use disorder treatment, um, I usually start methadone in the hospital because it's just easier. Um, and then if they're interested in transitioning to buprenorphine, then I do the low dose initiation while they're in the hospital to get them on buprenorphine. Now, uh, two quick comments to perioperative management. One, I, we mentioned you know, we're harping on shared decision-making. I think it's helpful for patients to understand what their options are. I've had patients you know, request to stop before the surgery based on prior experience with surgery. So important to you know, make a recommendation. We, I don't recommend you stop this for surgery, but create space for feedback. And then the second would be this idea of team-based care. Surgeons are a big part of this. We've had, I've had patients where surgery gets canceled when they report that morning that they took their last buprenorphine dose as I told them to. Important for communication with surgeons, with anesthesiologists. Experience and practice patterns can diff, uh, differ widely. And so you don't want patients to get stuck in the middle if I'm making a recommendation and their surgeon has an entirely different expectation. And I actually have a text from a surgeon watching online who had a question about if you, if a patient suspects they're going to go through withdrawal, it's a patient with known opiate use disorder, or the surgeon knows them possibly from a prior procedure. Do you ever anticipatorily start any of these things in the day or so before they start surgery? Is there a way to sort of prevent some of this symptom if they're going to come in for something that they know is going to be five or seven days in the hospital? Um, let's see. I think um, my experience with buprenorphine before surgery is, is perhaps not exactly this context, but I, it is very important to plan starting buprenorphine with what's happening in a person's life in that next week, in that next month. And so if somebody is on a stable regimen, but is interested in buprenorphine, I typically recommend starting buprenorphine as a brand new medication the week before surgery. So let's keep things stable. We'll get you to buprenorphine right after the surgery um, with the goal that they're going to do well in surgery and we're not going to um, try something new right before. That's probably true of other medications and no different from uh, preoperative management. Not sure that's addressing exactly the question, though. It, maybe more broadly, a goal would be to help patients be in a place where the, they are stable going into surgery. And so if somebody's using fentanyl multiple times a day, that's probably going to be a, a chaotic environment in which to go to surgery. And so if it is an opportunity to begin effective opioid use disorder treatment before surgery, could be with methadone or buprenorphine, really it's a matter of comparing to the alternative. So it can be a good option, but um, you know, again, shared decision-making to get the calendar right.
Yeah. And I think this was for someone who is uh, treatment naive, who let's say they've had a surgery a day or two after that prior procedure, they went through withdrawal. It was a difficult experience. They're not coming in for another planned procedure. Do you ever, do, would your service, would addiction medicine want to be consulted in this case? Or how would the sur- how could we help the surgeons manage those patients so that we expect something that could be difficult to happen in the five or seven days after their surgery? If the patients in the hospital absolutely consult us, we don't see patients um, pre-hospitalization. So I would recommend um, for that patient that experienced withdrawal before, they really need to get themselves to an OTP and get on methadone. Um, and then we can continue the methadone or get to a buprenorphine prescriber and get themselves on buprenorphine. Um, I think um, really when you're using fentanyl, what we're seeing people using it eight to 12 times a day, the withdrawals are horrific. The high is incredibly sedating. That lifestyle is too chaotic. Um, we, they need to be stable before they're going to the OR if there's an option for a elective surgery. That's great, thank you. And I know we're right at one o'clock. So uh, I'll just say thank you to both of our speakers today. Thank you for starting this off, I appreciate it.